Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship. On this program, we present the seven biblical dispensations, the key to Bible study and interpretation. If you would like a free copy of this message, you may view and or download it from our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com or listen for additional contact information at the end of the program. And now our study of the seven biblical dispensations. Dispensations in the Bible is the key to Bible study and interpretation, just like it says. It is. Noah lived in a different dispensation than you do. Noah was told to build an ark. You're not told to build an ark. That's a very simple example of being a dispensational Bible student. Anyway, God might use that ark you build in your backyard if you've got a yard big enough to hold an ark. But He's not actually telling you that, and that's because you understand you're not living in that dispensation. Now, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, read that with me. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Is everyone there? Read that with me. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, obviously, you're commanded there to study, and you want to be approved not to me, not to other people, but to God. Those are obvious truths. Uh, a workman... So it takes work. But look what it continues to say, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, a lot of people just have this kind of whimsical attitude, I'll just read the Bible and I'll just take what I can from it. And they treat the Bible like a cookbook. If you want no-baked cookies, you open the cookbook, you look for no-baked cookies, and you cook it. You don't read the whole cookbook. You don't study the entire thing. And that's recommended for cookbooks. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you try to study the whole thing. But the Bible isn't a cookbook. The Bible is a complete book. And no more would you pick up one of the famous, you know, pick up Moby Dick. Are you just going to read chapter 6 and then thumb through it and see if there's something else you might like? Moby Dick's hard enough to read and get anything out of it. <laughs> you better read it from start to finish or you're not going to understand anything about it. Name your book. If it's a novel, if it's a, any kind of a standard literary work, you read it from the start to the finish. That Bible is no different. And as you read it, you have to rightly divide it. And that's really what dispensationalism, or being a dispensational Bible student is. You rightly divide the Word of Truth. You, you look at what you're reading, and in your mind, you put it where it belongs. And that's what rightly dividing the Word of Truth is. I gleaned this information from several different sources. Uh, Bullinger, Larkin, Oliver B. Green, H. I. R. Ironside, uh, J. Vernon McGee, Peter Ruckman, uh, even Hal Lindsey's stuff. I mean, all kinds of people have these things. But this is a basic layout of the dispensations. What you're looking at from the eternal past to the eternal heaven, that is the entire revelation of Scripture in a chart. And when you're reading the Bible, you have to take a look at where it is you're reading and then interpret the Scripture with that in mind. Now, some people put names on these, like where I, I have Adam, they'll put... They call that the age of innocence because they were placed in the garden. They were innocent, sinless. And then the second one where I have Seth, uh, they call that human government. And they just give these titles. And I, I don't like adding anything to, you know, it, I, to me it just causes more confusion adding more words. The Bible gives us these dispensations, as you're seeing there, and at every turn or change from one dispensation to the next, he has a man. Now, there are differences. If you read that first dispensation between Genesis 1 and 3, there are things that are about them that aren't true of us, and I'm very thankful because I don't want to walk around naked. But that's what they did during that dispensation. They didn't wear clothes. It was at the end where he made coats of skin. So, raise a hand. How many of you wish we were in the age of innocence? So we could walk around. Don't answer that. I don't want to know. But <laughs> the, the, the main characters are listed there. The Lord, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And then what happens? 
Each dispensation ends with judgment. And then we have what was called the fall. When Eve ate of the fruit, it wasn't an apple. It doesn't say apple in the Bible. So be careful to not add what's not there. It was called fruit. That's all. We're not sure what it was. And then that's the fall. So that's the end of the first one. Now the second one starts off with Cain and Abel. But the man that he builds upon is Seth. Later on we read about the sons of Seth, and when you read the genealogies, it's Adam begets Seth, and Seth begets, and it goes on down to our next dispensation. Well, it started when they were kicked out of the garden. And it began with hope. <laughs> and Cain and Abel and Enoch and Methuselah, we come down to Noah, and we all know what happened. The world got so evil that God decided to destroy it with a flood. That's the end of dispensation number two. So you can see the Bible is clearly laid out with these beginnings with hope and these end, endings with judgment. And so we'll come back to that chart in a minute. But I want you to look at Ecclesiastes. You want to turn there. We're going to read a couple, three verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes, of course, was written by King Solomon. And we're going to see that these dispensations have a time element to them. But it's not an exact thing as far as we understand it. I want to make that clear. If somebody tries to be just exact and tell you exactly where every dispensation begins and ends, there's several of them that kind of overlap. There's a few that have a little gap. We're actually, we're going to see that after the rapture, there may be a, there is a gap of we don't know how long between the rapture and the seven-year treaty being signed. and So there's a gap between the end of the age of grace and that 70th week of Daniel and so forth. But God is the one who's in control. God has this thing all planned out. So we can, we can rest assured that it's all going to work out. Beginning in verse 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, read that verse with me. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, some folks will grab a hold of that and say, See, there's no use to even study prophecy. You can't know. The Bible says man can't know. What he's saying, if you remember, Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of man on the earth, the flesh. And on your own, forget it. You can't figure it out. That's why you, uh, you go study the guys who tried to figure out God's plan. Nostradamus, Gene Dixon, that uh, John Edwards that's running around being, playing all psychic and everything. They have no idea. Uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, reading a story the other day about, you remember the psychic hotlines? And they'd show these weird people and they'd call and I'll tell you. You're... You know what's funny is they went bankrupt. Didn't they see it coming? <laughs> see what I'm saying? I mean, if just a little common sense cures a lot of stupidity, it would be a lot of money saved by a lot of people if they just, you know, think about what they're doing. They call these psychic hotlines or go see John Edwards or whoever. That Silva Brown, Sylvia Brown, I think is her name. That, uh, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but she just looked the part, if you know what I mean. But uh, God... Knows. Now, we may not know every detail, even with the Scripture, um, because He doesn't tell us everything. But He has laid out His plan. Uh, read uh, verse 14, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. Read that with me. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before Him. Now, you all know I'm a big... Uh, patriot. <laughs> I love my country and I know you do too. And I'm all about stopping the new world order as far as dimming the tide of evil. Like Matt prayed that we could be used of God and that God would stem the tide of evil. I'm all for that. But don't think for a minute that that involves changing God's plan. God is going to work this thing out the way God wants to and we're not going to change that. But the only question is, do you know exactly how God's going to work it out? No, we don't know exactly. We know the basics. 
We know there's coming a new world order that will, I mean, they've got one now, but there's coming a new world order that will totally control everything. Everything you, that those on earth buy, sell, and trade. Those who don't take the mark will have to go to barter. We're not going to stop that. And I, I love these guys, but a lot of these guys are out there th saying, we can stop this, we can, you know. Uh, no, we're not. We can delay it in the sense that we can make sure that we do our part, that we are not the generation that just lets it happen. Um, but what I pray and hope that I, f the way I got it figured out is the rapture takes place before it all happens, and I hope that's how it works out. And I believe, I'm not just talking about the pre-trib rapture, but I mean as far as the New World Order setting up global government, we're close enough for my taste. I don't want to get into it anymore. Just pray that it, we, we see the evil tide stemmed until the time of the rapture, and then they can have it. But that uh, is the basis for dispensational study. You believe that God is in control. See, we do not believe in this God up there wringing his hands, worried that, oh, you know, that things may not, you know, that's not our God. Our God is in control, and we know that he's in control, and dispensations demonstrate that he has told us enough about what he's going to do. And again, as you look through this, you see that he's done it in the past. And if he did it then, and he didn't miss a beat and never did a thing that he didn't say he would do and never missed it and said I'm going to do something and didn't do it, did he? That makes sense? <laughs> He's 100% batting average. Every one of those in the green, chalk them up. God said it, he did it, that settles it. Amen. We're in this little area that's kind of off white there, the under grace. And uh, He's going to be working things out there. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this is in the New Testament. We're going to read really the same thing that Solomon said, only spelled out much more clearly and dogmatically, that God has this thing called a dispensational plan, a plan of the ages. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning of verse 10, just listen as I read. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So there's that word right from the scripture, dispensation. And we see there that there's a dispensation he's referring to specifically, which we know is going to take place at the end of the tribulation and uh, the millennial kingdom. And then at the end of the millennium, he actually then, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 told us that he will then deliver that up to the Father, that kingdom. So it all works together. But in verse 11, I want you to read that with me in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Now there's no arguing with this that God has ordained how this is all going to work out. It is predestinated, and what that means is simply this. God is going to do it. Man is not going to change it. These Satanists and people who think that they're going to somehow thwart the plan of God, they're following their father, Lucifer. And you go back to Isaiah 14, he thought he could change the plan of God, and it got him kicked out of heaven. You're not going to change it, and we have obtained an inheritance, and we have that confidence of knowing that it's all predestinated in the power and authority and sovereignty of God that He is going to make this happen. And it's a, it's a sure thing. It's a, I don't want to, you know, I hate to say the word sure bet, but, <laughs> but if you were ever going to gamble, gamble on God. It's a sure thing. And in verse uh, 12, that He says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. So there's the key to it all for you. If you want to be a part of this thing, you want to be a part of God's plan, you have to have trusted in Christ 
and those who have trusted in Christ will be to the praise of His glory. Now, I want to give you an example again. We're going to go, I told you we was going to look at this. Just an example of uh, how a dispensation starts and finishes. And if you want to, you can turn there. Genesis chapter 1. And I know this is a big word. Dispensation. But just think of dispensing. D dispensing. God is dispensing. Dispensation. And in each age, He's dispensed uh, our responsibilities and He's dispensed judgment when they've been, uh, when man has rebelled. And in Genesis 1.26, we saw the creation story. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You may remember, a uh, very similar thing is given to man again after the flood, because when man was put in the garden, he had dominion over everything. When he fell, he lost that. And then God gave that back to an extent uh, when Noah came off the ship after the flood, came off the ark. So there's where we have the establishment of a beginning of a period of time or age of uh, God dealing with man. And then we saw three, uh, two chapters later, they sinned. They fell, and in Genesis 3.17, it says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, that happened at the end of the first dispensation. That has continued all the way and will continue all the way until we reach this last dispensation, the ground is cursed, the ground has been cursed. So that's an example of something carrying over beyond the dispensation that ended. Now, the next dispensation, you remember, the, the uh, second ended with a flood. And that was the end of the flood. So that didn't carry over. So you see how there's some differences between some, the result just carries on through. The curse, the fall, we still have it. The cursed ground, that's still here. Um, and then there are some things about the end of the flood. When they came off the ship, there was Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and humanity was separated into three main groups, and then those three main groups broke into different other groups, and that remains to this day. So each dispensation has some things that carry over and some that don't. This practice of rightly dividing the Word of Truth is key to many things, and if you don't, it will result in all these bad things that I've listed here. I just gave a few examples. All the church splits and denominations, uh, when you talk about the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the Pro Protestants and Baptists and all those, it is because of their method of interpreting the Bible. They don't take the Bible literally when it comes to Bible prophecy, for example. And uh, they do take it literally in places where it shouldn't be, like taking the bread and the wine and believing they actually can turn it into flesh and blood. So it's because of this practice of wrongly dividing the Word of Truth that we have that big split between the Roman Catholic Church and the rest of the church. But there's also splits among uh, the charismatic movement, for example. The charismatic movement has split all kinds of churches and started whole new denominations based on the fact that they wrongly divide the Word of Truth and they try to take the book of Acts and make it stick today. And that's why you have all the craziness and all the, you know, and the people claiming they can heal and all that sort of thing. Because they're trying to take something that belongs to another dispensation and bring it into ours. And we could go on and on. Eternal security. You know, uh, in the Old Testament, you could lose your salvation. In the Great Tribulation period, you can lose it. So people say you can lose your salvation. They're not wrong. They're just wrong about what age they live in. People are going to lose their salvation during the Millennial Kingdom. They're going to be in the Kingdom. They're going to be saved. But then they're going to rebel and they're going to lose it. Why? Because it's a totally different dispensation. 
You live in the dispensation, I've pointed again at something that's not up there, but you live in the dispensation of grace, wherein you have been born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are saved and eternally secure. And there are people out there, we talked about that with the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God, you compare those two. And the kingdom of heaven, there are people in the kingdom who are going to be plucked out and thrown into hell. Based on that, people say, see, you can lose your salvation. And that's not talking about a born-again believer during the church age. That's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is not today. So you can see the problems there. And num number two is obviously spiritual growth is stunted. And you think about the people who don't rightly divide the word of truth. Think about those people you know who think they can lose their salvation, who think they should speak in tongues and pay faith healers so they can be well. And Think of all those people. They're, they're spiritually stunted. Their growth is stunted. And they never grow up. You also be an ineffective witness. Put the cults over here, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, because they think that they think they're earning their way to heaven by doing all that. But without considering the cults, who do you see going out soul winning? Who do you see going out door to door? Who is out there preaching the gospel? I don't mean preaching, because there's a lot of people out there preaching, but they're not preaching the gospel. Those who follow this dispensation, the church up the road that is always down here in town passing out tracts and witnessing people, they're dispensational. Uh, the great ministries who have reached people, even the people that I don't agree with, like Billy Graham, who I have a lot of problems with, but the reason he was so evangelistic is he was dispensational. And you look at all the men who were out there preaching and trying to reach the lost, they were motivated by their growth in the Word of God, studying it dispensationally. Ineffective teaching. Why do you turn on these guys and all they're ever talking about is money and all they're talking about is, you know, put your faith in me and I'll heal you or, you know, all these, uh, you're so wonderful and let's just all tell each other we love each other. And all that. Why do you see that? Because none of those people, those preachers, are dispensational. And because of that, they have nothing to say. <laughs> um, and then you have false doctrine heresies we already talked about, including believing you can lose your salvation and all that sort of thing. But there's one major heresy among non-dispensationalists. Those preachers who do not preach the dispensations, if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the major heresy that you'll find is mentioned here by Paul. And that is an attack on the simplicity in Christ. Salvation is a simple matter of you're a sinner, you're lost and going to hell, Jesus came to this earth, the sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, died on the cross in your place, paid the price in full, was buried and rose again, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. If you believe that, you're saved. It's that simple. But that's not what most churches are teaching, and the reason is because most churches are not dispensational. And in 2 Corinthians 11.3, read that with me. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ." And that's what Paul was fearing, that they would abandon that simplicity. Well, if you're not dispensational, you will abandon that simplicity. Again, if you go to the Roman Church or the Orthodox Church, they, they have this long list of things you must do for the rest of your life, and then at the end, you still end up in purgatory, and your family has to buy indulgences and pay for masses to get you out of purgatory. Why is that? They're not dispensational. You go to most Protestant churches, they take the babies and they sprinkle or pour on them, and then they take them through this thing when they get a certain age, and they go through confirmation, and then all this other stuff that they have to do and die in the church. And if they leave the church, they're considered apostate and they're going to hell. And that's what the, if you go to talk to a Lutheran pastor, Episcopal pastor, that's what they'll tell you. Why? Because they're not dispensational and they've got a false view of the church, they've got a false view of salvation, and they, that's why they preach it and people are then uh, caught up in these isms. The Augustinianism, basically Augustine is the architect of the Dark Ages in the Roman Catholic Church. Covenant theology, that's the people who sprinkle, sprinkle and pour in Lutheran churches and, and uh, Presbyterian churches. Hyper-Calvinism, which is that, that denies the, uh, uh, the, the necessity to preach the gospel to the lost. And they just say, well, let's sit back and just let the world go to hell. 
And sacerdotalism is the idea that you get to heaven through the sacraments. And that's in, like I said, the Roman Catholic Church. Alexandrianism, those churches that adopt the new Bibles, the new versions, they eventually, they may have started dispensational, but they also started with the King James Bible. When they adopt the new versions, they eventually go downhill. And they abandon that. And uh, cultism, all the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and all those, they are not dispensational. The date setters, you actually hear people say, those guys that t teach dispensationalism, they're always setting dates. That's not, even, uh, that's not even true. The Jehovah's Witnesses are not dispensational, and they set, they've set numerous dates. The guy who wrote the 88 Reasons Jesus Christ is going to return in 1988, he was not a dispensationalist. Harold Camping... Uh, recently predicted the return of Jesus Christ. He's amillennial, denies the dispensational framework. So the, it, it leads to uh, date setting, and they all end up denying the sufficiency of the cross. And that's why we say there's too much at stake. Don't be careless. Study to show thyself approved unto God and rightly dividing the word of truth. If you can just get this framework in your mind as you're reading... If you read through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, you can't help it. You just get that framework. Just real quick, look. if you look at this, you can see uh, the 69 weeks of Daniel, and that is at the end of the Old Testament period of law. 69 weeks ended, and that's where the church age began. And then... This 70th week is after the rapture. By just looking at that, you can see it just makes sense. There was no church during the 69 weeks. There's not going to be a church in the 70th week. That's just another reason for the pre-trib rapture. There was no church during the 69 weeks. That's in the Old Testament. The end of the 69th week is when Jesus Christ came into the city on the full of an ass, was rejected and crucified. That was the end of the 69 weeks. We are in the parenthesis between the 69th and the 70th week. And Daniel 9, 25-27 explains that that 70th week begins when the Antichrist shows up and signs a seven-year peace treaty and that's when the end begins. And that's the 70th week. That's seven years. And at the end of that seventh week, then Jesus returns. He's coronated king. It begins with hope for a thousand years as described in Revelation 20. But at the end, He annihilates those who rebel against Him. Then we have a great white throne judgment. And the unbelievers, unsaved dead, are cast into a lake of fire. The believers... And the saints are in glory, eternally in heaven. See how simple that is? You just get that chart and talk your way through it and do that from time to time and keep it fresh in your mind. Then when you read your Bible, you're going to have a head start on understanding what you're reading because you have a framework. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of mp3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.